This is the story of United Airlines Flight 553. On the 8th of December 1972, a Boeing 737-200 was on the way from Washington National Airport. And since this was the 1970s, nonstop flights weren't as prevalent yet, so they had a stop in Chicago. The plane left Washington at 12.50 p.m. with 55 passengers and 6 crew members on board. As soon as they rocketed out of Washington, the 737 got up to its cruising altitude of 28,000 feet. And that's where it stayed till it got close to Chicago International Airport. The Chicago Air Route Traffic Control Center cleared the jet all the way down to 4,000 feet. And from here, the pilots would be given radar vectors to intercept the ILS for runway 31 left. With that, the plane was handed over to Chicago Approach Control, and they told the pilots of Flight 553 to maintain 290 degrees till they intercepted the ILS of runway 31. As all of this was happening, Chicago Approach Control had its hands full with an aero commander that needed to go around. And that was being vectored back to the outer marker so that it could also land on runway 31 left. Therefore, Flight 553 was asked to slow down, first to 180 knots and then to 160 knots. As the jets slowed, they were allowed to descend all the way down to 2,000 feet. But unfortunately, the aero commander was getting a little bit too close to the 737, so the pilots of the 737 had to slow down even more. The aero commander was now being set up to land on runway 31 left. It was asked to turn inbound and was cleared to land on runway 31 left. The United 737 was only three miles behind the aero commander, and so the aero commander had to, quote, keep up as much speed as you can, end quote. As the aero commander continued its approach, the controllers let the pilots of the 737 know that they were second in line for landing. The 737 descended towards its assigned altitude of 2,000 feet as it screamed towards the outer marker. As the 737 overflew the outer marker, the controller said, United 553, continue inbound. You're number two on the approach. I'll keep you advised. End quote. The aero commander now had the runway in sight and the controller started to have second thoughts. He thought about putting the smaller aero commander onto runway 31 right, but the aero commander was just too close to the runway to make that switch. So he decided to let the aero commander land and told the United Jet to go around. United 553, execute a missed approach, make a left turn to a heading of 180, climb to 2000. Okay, left turn to 180, left turn okay, came the reply. Seconds later, the controller said, United 553, contact departure control, now 118.4. But no reply came to that call. The controller's attention then turned to his radar scope. The radar track of flight 553 was really off. As the green sweeps updated the radar screen, the dot representing flight 553 drifted away from where it should be and then it disappeared. The 737 crashed into a residential neighborhood less than a mile and a half short of the runway. Right from the crash site, they knew that the jet had gone down in a wings up level attitude. Kind of like the plane was trying to climb out, but nothing that the pilots did could stop the earth from bringing the plane back down. After initial contact with the tree, it started scraping telephone poles until the jet crashed into some houses. Two people on the ground and 43 people on the plane unfortunately lost their lives. The crash site itself told the investigators a lot about the final moments of the plane. The thrust reversers were stowed, the flaps were almost fully extended, and the engine sustained heavy damage on the inside, meaning that they were producing thrust right up to the very end. From what they could tell, this jet had no reason to crash. The first thing that they did when they got the wreckage was to check the ADC or the air data computers. The air data computers take in air pressure data and then convert that into airspeed and altitude data that the pilots rely on to safely land their planes. If the ADC malfunctioned in a visually limited environment like the one that Flight 553 found itself in, then this crash could be explained away. So they checked to see if ice or the plane's abnormally high attitude at the end of the flight would have produced errors that could have led the pilots astray. But nope, the instruments were just fine. Listening to the cockpit voice recorder, they heard the controller tell the jet to slow down to keep it from getting too close to the aero commander. Sure, the plane was slowing down, but not as much as it could have. 
but still, everything was looking okay. There was nothing in the data that suggested that the plane could crash at any moment. Then, while listening to the CVR, they heard the stick shakers go off right as the captain ordered a go-around. Usually, when the stick shaker goes off, you know that you're on the precipice of a stall. So, they looked at how the approach was flown by the two pilots. You see, Right from when they left 4,000 feet for 2,000 feet, the pilots were taking a bit of time to get back to the ATC with their readbacks. This was because they did not know exactly how far away they were from the Kedzie outer marker. They did not have DME values or distance measuring equipment values for this approach. They just didn't realize how close they were to the outer marker. All of this meant that the plane crossed the Kedzie outer marker at 2,200 feet. 700 feet higher than what was needed for this approach. With them just being a minute and a half away from the runway, they needed to lose a lot of altitude and fast if they were going to make this landing. When the captain realized the situation that he was in, he called for a higher descent rate of 1,550 feet. Then, when they got to the final descent check, he was still trying to prep this plane for landing and in a hurry. The only thing is that this check needed to be done way before the plane hit the outer marker, if it was going to be done at all. Doing it this close to the runway meant that the workload in the cockpit went through the roof. The lack of flight data recorder data meant that the next part of the investigation would be really hard. They had to ascertain characteristics of the final moments of the flight from audio recordings and from the rudimentary radar data that they had from the airport. The CBR spectrogram told them that the engines were at 59% N1 all throughout the descent, and the spoilers were used to hit that 1550 feet per minute of descent. The checklist that we talked about before was not completed until they had leveled off at 1000 feet. This meant that the first officer did not make any of the needed altitude callouts, nor did it look like he was monitoring the altitude of the plane. The radar data showed that the pilots leveled off very suddenly, a sign that in the cockpit the captain was distracted. The fact that he was coming up on his minimum descent altitude came as a surprise to him as he had been working on so many things, the checklist, the instruments, so on and so forth. The first officer called out that the spoilers were armed and the buzz of activity in the cockpit returned. As the jet leveled off, the captain added a bit of power to maintain the reference speed for the landing. The left engine was pushed to an N1 value of 72 and the right engine to an N1 value of 79.2. But as the throttles were being advanced, the stick shaker started to go off. The keen-eyed among you, or should I say the keen-eared among you, should already know what went wrong in the cockpit of Flight 553 in those final moments. The spoilers were still out. In the hustle and bustle of the cockpit, they forgot to retract the spoilers meaning that the airflow over the wings was being disrupted and the plane was struggling. The investigators did some tests with the flaps at 30 like they were on flight 553 and the stall speed would have been around 105 knots. That is without the spoilers being out. However, if the spoilers were deployed to the flight detent position, then the stall speed would be 116 knots at the angle of attack that they had. Both of these speeds were well below the reference speed of 125 knots. The pilots just didn't add enough power once the plane leveled off. You see, the aggressive level off maneuver stole some momentum from the plane, meaning that they started to bleed off more airspeed than they intended. The thrust increase added 13,900 pounds of thrust to the plane, and in normal circumstances, that would have been enough. But with the spoilers being out, they needed 14,500 pounds of thrust to overcome the extended spoilers. With the first officer busy with other things in the cockpit, no one was looking at the speed of the plane. But here's the thing, even with the spoilers out, they still had enough power on tap to climb out if they had gone to max power once the stick shaker activated. However, once the stick shaker went off, the captain's immediate response was to reconfigure the aircraft pulling the flaps up back to 15 degrees, robbing the jet of precious lift that it needed to stave off a stall. In the cockpit, the captain immediately realized his mistake and said, want more flaps? Flaps 15. I'm sorry. And a click was heard as he selected full flaps back again. But it was too little, too late. 
Even though he had commanded full power, at this point the stall was on and they could do nothing to save the plane. All of this stemmed from one thing going wrong. Them not knowing how far away they were from the airport, and from there it just snowballed. Remember, you can always go around. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.